and Titus. And chapter 2 isn't too long, so we'll just read the whole chapter here. I'm going to focus mostly on uh, verses 11 through 14. And it's talking to Titus, who's a a minister who's um, on the island of Crete, and he's been charged with uh, appointing leaders for the church there. So it says, You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the Word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled, and everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to everybody, and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and obedient lives. Let's uh, look at the screen here. Let's say it together and then let's see if we can say it without it on the screen. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have light in his name. John twenty thirty one. And take it away. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John 20, 31. There's a lot of things that are written in God's word here. There's a lot more that could be written. But we have here everything that we need to know. Now, As Christians, it's really important that we live Christian lives for the right reasons. It's really important that not just that we live as Christians, but that we do so for the right reasons. Because the scariest things that Jesus had to say were not to the sinful people, They were to the Pharisees, the good people, the people who were outwardly believers, but inside they were not. And so it's very important that we live Christian lives for the right reasons, not because because of just appearances or anything like that, but for the right reasons. If Christianity, if, if what we're doing here, why we, why we come here, and, and if Jesus Christ is just about being a nice person, then we're just another religion. 
If, if this is just about being a nice person, an upstanding citizen, somebody who's friendly and neighborly, then this is just another religion. And to be honest, there's probably, there's many other religions out there that would make a lot, be a lot easier on you. There'd be a lot more religions that would be much more in line with our culture and you would be able to just have smoother sailing and you'd be able to do more of what you wanted to do and you wouldn't have to, wouldn't have to carry a cross or anything difficult like that. So as Christians, if you, if you are a believer, if you see things like Bible reading, prayer, worshiping, and serving as demands, then you're missing something. If you see things like Bible reading, prayer, worshiping, and serving as demands, requirements, hoops to jump through, then you're missing something. You're missing something. Because it's, it's less that Christians have to do these things it's not that Christians have to do all of these things that God, God commands as much as they can't help but do them. This shouldn't come from a, a place where I have to do this. It should be Christ has done what for me? I'm, I'm more than ready to, to serve him, to love him, to do whatever he wants. So, we are not doing things out of obligation, but because we've been transformed. Verses 11 and 12, I'll read those again. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. God's grace trains us to live life His way. God's grace, which has come to us, trains us to live life His way. If you have experienced the grace of God... The more that sinks in, the more the love of God will just flow from you naturally. It won't be about, okay, I've got to meet certain quotas. It'll be, I, I, I just want to, I want to s- spread this around. God's grace trains us to live lives of surrender and obedience. Not because we have to, but because we can't help it. At least that's the way I've experienced it. When I was a kid, I always thought of Bible reading, prayer, going to church, and serving like things I had to do. Like, I'm a Christian, so I have to do these things. And as I've gotten older, I'm, yeah, I'm really old now, <laughs> but anyways, uh, after 35 years, I'm starting to learn that, that no, I, I want to read the Bible, because this is God talking to me, and I, I want to pray to God, I, I need to pray to God, because, because He can do anything, I want to, I want to talk to Him, and and I don't have to serve others. I just, I just want to. And that's not because that's not because I'm I'm following some code. It's because I I'm starting to realize more what Jesus really did and what that means. It's starting to sink in more. God's grace came to us in Jesus Christ. God's grace is the person of Jesus Christ. We don't follow rules. We follow a person. 
We don't follow rules. We follow a person. One of Jesus' recurring phrases when he was talking to people was not do, 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 but follow me. Follow me. Follow me. We follow a person. All the other religions out there, they give you rules to follow. They give you things that you have to do. But if you believe that Jesus is really the Son of God, then you don't follow a code. You follow a person. It's not some abstract thing that we follow. We follow a person. And the more you get to know this person, the more you become like this person. Christ died in this life to free us from being slaves to sin in this life. So verse 14, He gave Himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for Himself a people that are His very own, eager to do what is good. So Christ died on the cross and He rose and ascended to purify us. He died in this life to free us from being slaves to sin in this life. So, let's look, think about sin for a minute. Sin shows itself in our actions, but sin really resides in our hearts. Sin shows itself in our actions, but really it comes from in our hearts. So, the outward acts of sin are sinful, but really, they're kind of like the symptoms of the disease. They're not the disease itself. So, murder, sexual immorality, stealing, lying, cheating, fear, stubbornness, these are... These are acts on the outside, things that we can do, but the real problems are things like wrath, lust, envy, greed, pride. Those things you can't really, they're not as tangible. They're, they're conditions of a person's heart. That's what the problem is. And so that's why the Pharisees could say, look at all of the good stuff we do. And Jesus said, yeah, you can do all that good stuff on the outside. What's on the inside? Greed, pride, anger, and so forth. So we can look good on the outside, but still be rotten on the inside. We can look good on the outside. We can have all of the appearances of being a good Christian, and we can be rotten on the inside. One of, one of the scary things that Jesus had to say for the, the self-righteous people who looked good on the outside, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And then he goes on to say, You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? That's some scary words. And again, these were not said to the murderers, the thieves, the adulterers. This was said to the good people. The people who looked good on the outside. I think a lot of us would fit into that category. So we're quick to worry about how others see us. It's in our human nature to worry about how others view us. 
we want to have a good image. There's kind of an honor thing. And so we're always, we're always thinking about how other people see us. That's why one of people's biggest fears is standing up in front and talking to people. Because we're, we're worried about appearances. We're worried about what other people think about us. But instead of focusing on the outside, let's focus on the inside. Because it's what's inside that's killing you. Sin is something that lives in our hearts. That's the real problem. That's the real problem. So how do we do that? When God loves us, it powerfully transforms us so that we want to be like him. So if you've experienced the love of God in your life, that should be changing you. You should be seeing the world differently. You should be seeing yourself differently. You should be seeing others differently. You should be seeing your job differently. If you've experienced God's love, then that changes everything. That changes everything. And this is not something that we can really do on our own. To save our hearts from sin, we need Christ to come in and clean house. To save our hearts from sin, where the real problem is, we need Christ to come in and clean things up. It's not that we need to do some spring cleaning. We need to have Christ come in and do some spring cleaning. Again, verse 14, To redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So we, we live by faith. We live by believing in Jesus Christ. We do good things because we believe in him. Not because we have to, but it starts from a place where I believe that Jesus is the real thing. And he was who he said he was. And I'm following him. That's where all of our Christian acts need to come from. Jesus really was the one he said he was. He was the real thing. He really did rise from the dead, and I'm following him. So if rejecting sin and doing good is a pain, then you need to grow closer to Christ. If rejecting sin, turning away from it, and doing good things, doing what God commands is, if that's a pain, if it's annoying, if it's irritating, if it's a burden, if it's one of those things you have to do, then you need to know Christ more. It's about growing closer to Christ. This, it, John, 1 John 5, verses 3 and 4, it says, This is love for God, to obey His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. His commands are not burdensome. Why? Because everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. God's commands aren't burdensome because we believe that he really is the real thing. And if we believe he's been the real thing, that means that God is working in our lives and we're being reborn. Look at the, uh, oh, oh, thank you. <clears throat> it's not about trying harder, it's about knowing Christ more. So, if, if you live in this world of, I have to do this, this, and this, and this, and this, then, then it will feel like, oh, I just got to try harder. I just got to work harder. I got to do more. And that sounds exhausting. I already got a lot of things to do. 
if, if, if this is the way it is, then, then you need to know, more, know who Christ is more. Not that you need to do more. You need Christ more. It's about knowing Him. The more you know Him, the more you'll want to be like Him. It's, it's pretty much that simple. Because He's the best thing that has ever been on this planet. No matter what things you enjoy or think are great here and now, He is the best thing that will ever happen to any one of us. And the more you know Him, the more you get to know who He really is, the more you'll want to be like him. He's that amazing. Okay, now look at the screen. Why do you say that by faith alone you are right with God? It is not because of any value my faith that God is pleased with me. Only Christ's satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness make me right with God. And I can receive this righteousness and make it mine in no other way than by faith alone. So Christ has already done all the work for us. All of these rules, He's already done them all. He's got that covered. That road has been paved. We need to, by faith, follow Him. We need to realize that He really is our Savior. And so we don't follow the code. He did that. We follow Him because He did it. If we try to follow the code, we will fail miserably. Because even if we look good on the outside, on the inside, we're still rotten. We still need a lot of work. When I look at, at the outside, you know, I, feel, I, I see some some things and that that I can improve on, you know. And and uh, you know, if you're if you're married, do you always you always have somebody who will point out the areas where you need to improve on. That's just one of the blessings of being married. But if I look on the inside, wow, I need a lot of work. Cuz on the outside, I, I I you know, I'm pretty good on the outside, but boy, on the inside, sheesh. I, I, I need to change. I need to know Christ more. <clears throat> we grow closer to Christ just like we get to know any other person. We grow closer to Christ just like we would get to know anybody else. It's really not that hard. So when you meet somebody and you want to get to know them, what do you do? One thing you do is you listen to them. And you listen to Christ by knowing what he says here. Now, every, we, we have a lot of what he says here. Not, all, not every last thing, but we have a lot. We have enough. So if you're going to get to know Christ, you need to listen to what he says. L- hear him out. Take it seriously. He knows what he's talking about. He's been in heaven. We haven't. He's eternal. We're not. He's God. We're not. So listen, listen to him. Talk to him in prayer. So, you know, when you're, when you're getting to know somebody, you, you, there's, a, there's an exchange. There's a give and take. You know, you share your things and they share theirs. Well, we talk to God. And, and I, hope that, I hope that your prayers are, are more of, you know, Lord, I, I want to get to know you more. It's really easy to come to God kind of like we would be sitting on Santa Claus's lap and being like, okay, this is what I want for Christmas, you know. I, I hope that you pray with, uh, Lord, show, show me who you are today. Help me to know who you are today. What is it that you want me to do today? How can I grow closer to you today? 
what, where do I need to improve? Where do, where do I need to know you more? What am I missing about you? Spend time with him, which means for us participating in the church, which the Bible says is his body. This is something that, that I think, um, and I've, I've read some stuff on this, this is something that, at least in our denomination, we, ha- we're not, we don't have a good history of doing this well. And yeah, we go, to, we go to church and stuff like that, but, but in surveys of Christian Reformed churches, there's very few people who say, I have somebody who spiritually mentors me. Or I, I know somebody who will pray for me. With me. Um, I, have, I have somebody that I could confess a sin to. You know, we're, we're, we're private people. We tend to make our faith kind of a private thing. And by participating in the church, the body of believers, we get to know Christ more. There's a reason why we all have different gifts, because we can all help each other in different ways. Ephesians 4, We will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body joined in together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So if you're all by yourself, then you're, like, you're lopsided. I mean, if you cut off a finger on somebody's hand, then, then are you part of the body? Not really. You need to be attached to the body to be part of the body. And for those of you who have been walking with Christ for a while, maybe you do those, those things. You need to take maybe, some, maybe there's something else you need to do. Try walking in His shoes. Do the hard commands. Take some risky obedience. Try some of that. If you, if you feel like you got the prayer and the Bible reading down and the being a part of the church thing down, then your next step is to try walking in His shoes. Do some risky stuff. So like, show kindness and love to an enemy who's a total jerk. Try that. That's what Jesus did. Say no to your biggest temptation. Say no. And say it with authority. See what happens. Find ways to spend less on yourself so that you can help people who are really in need. Find ways to cut back so you can help others. Talk about Jesus Christ to people who will laugh and mock and reject you. Talk about Jesus to people who will laugh at you. He experienced all kinds of laughter and rejection and so forth. If you want to walk in his shoes, that's part of it. Share your faith with someone you'd never expect to be receptive. Think of somebody who you think, oh boy, that, that person would never, never change in a million years. That person would never think or come around to Christ. You'll be surprised at what kind of people will accept Christ. Or the ultimate. Tell somebody who's holding a gun to your head, that you would gladly die for Christ. If you want to really follow Christ, then tell somebody that you would gladly die or suffer, whatever, because of Him. That's what He did. That's the road He walked. 
If you've got these basic things down, try some of the harder stuff. Because when you see some of the harder stuff, you'll think, boy, I could never do that. And that's right. You can't do it. God can. You'll see God show up in ways that you would never expect. Having God as your Father and Christ as your Lord is difficult, but it always rewards. Having God as your Father and Christ as your Lord is difficult, but it always rewards. So when we were growing up, our parents had maybe some rules for us to follow. They, they disciplined us. They gave us chores to do and things like that. We didn't always like that. At least I didn't. But it, it's good for you. It's not what you want, but it's what you need. In the word here, where it says in verse 12, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. The grace of God teaches us. The Greek word for teach has a wide range of meaning. It can mean train, teach, discipline, correct, even whip, scourge, beat. Now, I was spanked as a kid. I, I didn't like it, but yeah, it happened. And were there times I deserved it? Yeah. Were there times that it corrected my behavior? Yeah. So, Having God as your father, as a good father, he's going he's gonna to raise you like a good father. That means, that means some discipline. That means it's not going to be easy. But he wants the best thing for you. And if you have kids, then you can have a bit of an idea about what it's like. Because God has that kind of love for you. Better a beating from a loving God than being bullied by sin. Better a beating from a loving God than being bullied by sin. In Proverbs it says, Blows and wounds cleanse away evil and beatings purge the inmost being. The inmost being, that's where we need our most help. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Somebody who wants something from you is going to butter you up. Somebody who really cares about you is going to tell you the truth, even if you might not want to hear it. So if Christ has saved you, then why be bullied by pride? Why be bullied by jealousy and cravings and impulses? Say no. With God, don't obey to belong. Obey because you belong. It's not about obeying to belong. It's obeying because you belong. Love is not that we loved God, but that He loved us. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So, as Christians, make sure you live as a Christian for the right reasons, and that being out of faith and love for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we, we don't always enjoy the, the discipline, the hardships, and the even the commandments that you give us. But Lord, we pray that we would come to know you through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that we would follow him, that we would get to know him better, and that, Lord, our hearts would be transformed, not just on the outside, but that we would be changed on the inside, that we would want to follow you, that we would better understand your grace, and, and Lord, that we would... Uh, that we would just fully appreciate what it means 
to belong and that we would obey because of that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.